So I'm delighted to introduce our final speaker of the day. Uh, Brian Eng is a paleo artist, a filmmaker, photographer, and has collaborated with many of the paleontologists both in this room and across the state on visualizing what these extinct animals look like. And he's going to be talking about uh, scales, scutes, and spikes, the dizzying diversity of dinosaur skin through paleo art. Take it away. All right. Sounds weird on my side. Anyway, um, so yeah, as, as Randy said, I'm a paleo artist. I'm not a scientist, so just a disclaimer up front about that. Um, but I work with scientists regularly, so it behooves me to have a sense of like what's going on in the science and how that informs our ideas about what dinosaurs look like and how they live. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the time when we're reconstructing dinosaurs, um, hold on, it's not advancing. There we go. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times when we're reconstructing dinosaurs, we're working with animals where we really don't know much about what they look like. Um, in this case, this is Dilophosaurus. It's a famous dinosaur from northern Arizona that left footprints all over the southwestern United States, or at least we think Dilophosaurus or something like it did, down in southwest Utah where Andrew Milner and the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site people have been finding amazing track sites. You know, find all these tracks, and occasionally they'll find a. They found like one vertebrae. So we have this idea that this is an important animal, the ecology of the early Jurassic. But this is what the best skull of it looks like: is uh, is this situation right here, which is just like crushed, flat pieces are missing, and we definitely don't have any skin. So what we try and do when we look at dinosaurs is try and find if we can, any remnants of soft tissue, and then try and figure out how we can apply that to our understanding of their life and evolution. Um, and petrified or fossilized skin generally comes in kind of like two flavors. Here on, the, on this side, you have impressions. So this is pretty straightforward. This is where animal skin pushed up against some mud or some sand or some clay made an impression. On the other side here, we actually have the Audi, the, the, the opposite. This is not really the skin anymore. This is, in some cases, it's what we call permineralized skin, where the tissue actually absorbed minerals and was partially replaced, kind of like how bone fossilizes. In other cases, there's not even any skin left. In the case of Dilophosaurus and, 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 and the early Jurassic and Triassic, where there's not a lot of skin fossils, this is pretty much all we have. On, oops, on the, uh, on the, Let's see, on this side here, these are tiny, tiny little footprints of little long neck dinosaurs. These would be something similar to what you can see in the museum here called Seitad, that's found in the Navajo sandstone here in, in Utah. So that's like the little long necks in the early Jurassic and late uh, Triassic. This is pretty much all we have. We have some little footprints. We have some big footprints from the big ones. That's pretty much all we know for sure about their skin. And then. On this side here, we have uh, what's called a Ubrontes track. This is from the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site. And in both cases, you can see these are actually uh, not impressions anymore. They're positives. And that forms when animal steps in the mud. In this case, really nice clayey mud that captured these scale impressions. Animal pulls its foot out and leaves a hole. The next layer of mud or sand that falls into that hole washes in, fills it in, and if that turns into a harder rock that fossilizes better, then what survives is actually the mud that filled in the dinosaur footprint. And some of these ones at the St. George site are really awesome. This one, and so this is that same one. This is a zoom in on one of the toe pads. And you can see it's got all these little bumpy scales, just like what you'd see on the foot of a bird. And you even get a sense of the fatty pad of like fat and connective tissue this animal's walking around on. And then what I think is really cool is these scale scratch lines on the side that uh, Andrew Milner has, has you know, done a lot of work, you know, cataloging these. Because what these show you is that even if scales weren't preserved here, if you find these scale scratch lines in the mud, it actually shows you that there were scale on, scales on that part of the animal. Another example of that is this block. I know this doesn't look like much when you see it here, but this is actually the heel of a big meat-eating dinosaur. It squished down in the mud. These are its toes down here. And as it slid on the bank, it actually, its scales left these scratch marks. So this, this is a zoom in of right here. And um, 
So sometimes you get weird skin impressions like that. Other times you get these more permineralized or what we would say generally better preserved remnants of the skin. Now these things are so old. These, these are from the Cretaceous. So they're, they're much younger than the Lophosaurus. The Lophosaurus lived longer before these animals in the Cretaceous than these animals lived before us. These are animals that are around 70 to 100 million years old. The Lophosaurus was around 180. 190. But you can see here that there's actual like details of the animal's skin in incredible detail. And here they're actually like laminated onto the bone. So all that's left of the skin is some kind of a mineral residue. And it's a really complex process that scientists are just now starting to study to try and understand everything that happens to change these fossils. And basically, like in this case, these animals are crushed flat. They've been baked in the earth because these layers of rocks have been in the earth for so long. They've been modified by geologic processes. But there's some remnant of that animal skin still there. And so these are a really nice type of fossil. Oh, and these slides are coming through just a little out of order. This was the uh, explainer of that scale scratch line. And then this is another one of those early Jurassic scale scratch line. This is a close-up showing how the toe went in and then the toe came out and left this cool claw strike. Um, okay, so this is back in order. Now these are the, this is another kind of skin preservation where there was some skin there, but so much time has gone by and so much uh, alteration of the rock has happened that all that's really there now is sediment in the shape of skin. In other words, the animal skin, in this case, a big sauropod dinosaur from Dr Dinosaur National Monument from the Jurassic period, about 150 million years old. This animal died. Its skin sat in the sediment. And then over time, the skin actually decomposed or maybe was partially fossilized and then secondarily replaced. And if we zoom in, if we enhance like CSI, you actually can see that there's really not much of skin material left. It's like this, it looks just like sandstone, but it's in the shape of skin with some weird mineral crusts and stuff. So a lot happens to these animals. This whole process of the animal dying, decomposing, being buried, fossilized is called taphonomy, and it's, a, it's an emerging and fascinating science. It has a lot of important implications for paleo art, and we'll kind of circle back around to that to the end. This is the best case scenario. This is an Edmontosaurus mummy that's at the American Museum of Natural History. Rebecca Hunt Foster, who's here, took these pictures and was gracious enough to share them. And what you've got here, this is an animal, imagine like you've seen a dog lying on the lawn with their like legs splayed out. This guy's kind of lounging out like that. But the, you know, everything's decomposed, but the skin, these just like huge sheets of skin are layered onto the bones. So we actually can see what skin associates with what body parts, which you don't always get. So this is kind of your best case scenario in terms of dinosaur skin preservation. Um, here's another hadrosaur mummy at the same museum. This is Corythosaurus. And again, it's got this like pebbly, kind of scaly skin reminiscent of what you see on the legs of birds. Um, and some of the other cool details from that uh, Edmontosaurus, these are these funny like hoof-like pads. Um, this is actually a cast of the same specimen that you can see at the Dinosaur Museum down in Blanding. Um, the sad thing though for me as an artist is that you, whatever that beautiful face was is no more. Uh, facial tissue is rarely preserved because in that taphonomic process is, you know, the, the face is the entryway for scavengers and maggots and for, you know, all kinds of gross, gushy fluids to exit the body. So very rarely is anything preserved on the face. Um, so when we think about these dinosaurs, we, we have to take into account like our, our own human perspective on nature. We're trying to learn, and we bring biases to that. That Edmontosaurus and that Corythosaurus have been known about for over 100 years. But so has these fossils. This is Archaeopteryx, the early bird, which looks skeletally, if you look at that skull, it's kind of a basic little meat-eating dinosaur. It's, a, it's got a few adaptations skeletally that are, make it look like a bird, but these amazing impressions around its skeleton show, it, show us that in the late Jurassic period in Germany, they were very bird-like, or there were, di there were theropod, little meat-eating dinosaurs that had very bird-like body coverings. Um, and here you can see the hand. It's got a little pretty normal eating dinosaur claw hand. It's got these beautiful complex feathers. So this, this was known about also since the late 1800s, over 100 years. And even back in the 1800s, an English paleontologist named uh, 
Huxley, he proposed that like, well, this thing's skeletally really similar to this other dinosaur called Compsognathus. Maybe birds came from dinosaurs. And everybody was like, no, 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 no. Nobody was ready to accept that because it just, it just didn't make sense. Dinosaurs, because in part because we found those big, beautiful mummies of scaly hadrosaurs, and we recognize some reptilian features of these animals. Dinosaurs are thought to be these slow-moving, dim-witted reptilian things on a completely different evolutionary trajectory than birds. Um, so as a paleo artist, we have to start to try and visualize how things are changing through evolutionary time. We have to try and put it in context. So those hadrosaurs are up here in the duck-billed dinosaurs. They're way on another side of the dinosaur family tree. Now, we, this, is a, this isn't like a super specific phylogeny or family tree. This is created a little bit artistically to give you a sense of the vibe. You'll notice that there's stuff missing in the middle, Jura in the middle Jurassic and in the middle Cretaceous because we don't have those fossils. What scientists do is they look at the fossils we do have, they count up all the different changes that have happened from one group of animals to another, and they try to infer what, who is related to who. So a lot of these common ancestors in the early and middle Jurassic, in the early Triassic, and in the middle Cretaceous, we actually don't have those fossils. So I, I wanted to just kind of give a sense of how much actually isn't known. Because in both art and science, we have to assess. Like, okay, where have we been making mistakes? Where have we been falling down? And right now, you know, way back in the 1800s, we knew there were complex feathers on therapod dinosaurs. But we've been making a lot of wrong predictions since then. So we have to kind of assess that moving forward in art, especially if you want to reconstruct something like Dilophosaurus, where we have no skin from. Um, so one of the things that, in addition to like beautifully preserved duck-billed dinosaur skin that we've had for over 100 years are called osteoderms. This is Zool, a recently described large ankylosaur from Canada, from Alberta. And you can see it's got these lumpy textures all over its face and these awesome cheap blade horn things, and they've got these cool bumpy pits in them. Well, these are osteoderms. They're actually scales that have become reinforced with bone. Now, these are modern lizards. This is a, a Gila monster that we have out here in the southwest. And you can see it's got very similar little bumpy ossicles. And that's where bone grew into a scale to reinforce it and make a, basically a coat of armor. And this is a Galapagos land iguana. It doesn't have quite the same level of osteoderm modification, but the scales are actually interacting with the underlying bone in that animal as well. And you can see the similar pitting, like in Zool, on the cheeks of this crocodile, and in crocodile osteoderms. What that pitting is, is where blood vessels are actually interacting with the bone. And in some of these animals, at least in crocodilians, uh, Dr. Casey Holliday, who's here, has been looking at how these animals use different vascular systems for thermal regulation. So these are really important skin adaptations that dinosaurs had, and we've known about them for a long time. And what's really, really cool is we're just now starting to discover ones that actually have the skin that was over that bone preserved. This is the huge back carapace of Zool. This is about, I would say, like three or four meters long, like 12 feet long. And what's really cool about this is that the the, the horny sheath, that, that horn scale covering that covered the bone underneath has a totally different surface texture than the underlying bumpy pitted bone. This is the tail of Zool. These are paleontologists from the Royal Ontario Museum, Yara Haridi, um, and, uh, and Ashley for scale. And you can see this thing just has crazy, crazy, huge osteoderms. This is interesting to me because, you know, you the, these modifications to the animal's armor like dramatically change how it looks. And every one of these armored dinosaurs looks a bit different. Here you can see, uh, this is kind of a rough approximation of how much that horny scale covering enlarges the underlying bony horn, or bony scale really, on the shoulder of the uh, Boreal repelta. This is another Canadian one. This is a famous dinosaur we've all seen. Everybody knows Stegosaurus, right? Well, again, Stegosaurus, most specimens you see mounted in museums, they don't actually have real plates on them. They have casts, which are largely sculpture. And that's because the plates are extremely thin and fragile. This one is all real. This is Sophie the Stegosaurus from Wyoming, mounted in, uh, in London. And you can see every one of her plates is a little bit different. And part of that is because, well, they probably weren't for much defense. I mean, look how thin they are. Some of them are less than a centimeter thin, at least the bone. You know, you could have tons of tough, durable, scaly, horn skin material on top of that. 
but it seems like these plates are doing something more than defending the animal, whereas the spike tail at the end is definitely defending the animal, as is these ossicles on the throat. It has like, like the Gila monster, it has like a chain mail armor of uh, little bone embedded scales protecting its throat. No matter how you slice this, these are the largest scales that we have evidence of in the history of life. Dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs of a variety of different types grew massive, crazy scale structures. This one right here is the base of a stegosaur spine that was found actually in the ocean, or what was the ocean. It was found in the Kimberidge clay in the UK. So this animal's body floated out to sea, it settled at the bottom, it decomposed, and I, I should have shown the other side, there's actually oysters growing on this, there, there was oysters growing on this thing, Jurassic oysters. So this, this animal's skin adaptation was so elaborate that it formed a reef at some point in the Jurassic. <laughs> this is a plate of Stegosaurus at Dinosaur National Monument. You can see this one has a totally different shape than the ones on Sophie. This is a huge tail club on the Lake Cretaceous Ankylosaur. And again, that's another stegosaur plate. These are ridiculous, crazy, elaborate, extravagant skin adaptations um, that probably serve multiple functions, but not all of the functions can be explained simply as thermoregulation or defense from predators. These are just over the top on a bunch of levels. Horned dinosaurs also evolved osteoderms. On the side of the frill here, these are little, they call them epiparietal ossifications, which is like the biggest mouthful to say, little triangular scales that fused onto the frill of these dinosaurs. And as the dinosaurs aged, they would, the, the bone would actually adhere. And then over time, they would actually absorb, reabsorb that bone. So presumably the horny keratin sheath of those little scales was still growing, but for whatever reason, these animals absorbed some of the bone underneath. And then up top here, you can see this is uh, Chasmosaurus skin from 1912. We've had this amazing array of scale structures. And so these ornithischians, these plant-eating dinosaurs with various kinds of armor and well, scales that have become bony, as well as scales that weren't bony, have the widest range of variation of scaly skin covering of any reptile that we know of. Nothing comes close. Even the biggest tur turtles don't have osteoderms the size of what we see in stegosaurs and in giant ankylosaurs. And then the other thing that's interesting, you get all these blood vessels. These are just like the blood vessels we see on the horns of bovids. Now, the horn on the snout of this chasmosaurus is, is not an osteoderm, it's actually a bone outgrowth. So they had osteoderms growing in the skin, and they were also growing their skulls in weird shapes and covering those things with skin. And as you can see in these antelope, the horny covering that would cover those dramatically increases the size and look of those features, just like what we saw also in that armor carapace of Zool. Um, these are some more uh, ceratopsian skin, just to show you that there's, there is a range of variation. Centrosaurus doesn't have the same skin on its butt as Chasmosaurus, and even Triceratops has different, slightly different scale patterns than these other animals. They kind of all follow a similar geometry, but they elaborate on it differently from species to species. So when we throw the osteoderms on the dinosaur family tree, this whole lineage is just crazy with osteoderms. But then we also have uh, Ceratosaurus, predatory carnivorous dinosaurs, at least one group independently expressed osteoderms. And then we also have Titanosaurus sauropods and Shunosaurus. So at least five-ish, um, you know, because we have the Ceratopsians and Pachycephalosaurus as well, at least five-ish independent expressions of this weird, elaborate skin adaptation. We also see them in crocodiles and turtles and things like that, and I think that's part of the reason why we, uh, we've kind of gotten comfortable with the idea of Stegosaurus having meter-long plates and spikes on its back. Um, but it's like, oh, well, that's what reptiles do. It's, we've, we've accepted it at this point. But it's a hint. It's a hint that this group of animals does crazy, crazy things with its skin. And there was another hint, Archaeopteryx. So for about 100 years, people just thought birds evolved from nowhere, some mysterious animal in the Triassic or Permian that we didn't have any fossils of. But then in the late 90s, Chinese farmers in Liaoning, in the Liaoning, Liaoning province started bringing in these slabs with these flattened dinosaurs on them. And these have extensive plumage. And they freaked people out because they, these are little raptor dinosaurs. I mean, this skeleton 
It looks very similar to Velociraptor or Dionicus, but as you can see, these animals have complex feathers like Archaeopteryx, very bird-like animals, and this blew people's minds. And the reason these were preserved like this is again because of that taphonomy thing we're talking about. You've got this perfect setting for preserving these animals. They were coming to a lake during a volcanic eruption. There was volcanic ash raining down, probably choking them and contributing to them dying. And they died in the lake, and volcanic ash covered them before anything could dramatically degrade their carcasses. This one is being shined with UV light to reveal all these little subtle mineral traces and details of its anatomy. Initially, it was just raptor dinosaurs, and there, people were like, okay, well, that's surprising, but we thought they were kind of close to the birds since the 70s. But then they started finding oviraptorosaurs, which are a bit further away. And so our family tree of dinosaur by weird body coverings went like this. We added a whole big group with a bunch of elaborations, but they were pretty close to birds. They were on the bird line. And so, you know, people who studied these things were like, okay, this makes sense. We're, we're, we're gradually adding bird-like dermal adaptations, skin adaptations. But then we started finding, people started finding ones that weren't very bird-like. This one is a therizinosaur, which is this weird group of theropods that nobody can really agree on, or at least they used to not agree on what they were related to. Now that they have feathers, they're conveniently falling out as related to the other feathered animals, but that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. And then we have Sinusoropteryx, which is a Compsognathus, or a Compsognathan. In many ways, again, this is your pretty basic little meat-eating dinosaur. It's not super bird-like, but it's completely covered in fuzz. And these are two very different sized of animals, too. Initially, people were thinking, oh, maybe it's just the small animals. They need to keep warm because they have little, little frail bodies. No, the big guys are even shaggier than the little guys. This is the, the close-up of the, the plumage on that therizinosaur. Um, so now, our family tree went like this. We added a whole bunch of fuzz of questionable complexity getting further away from birds. And then this was found. This is U. tyrannus quality. It's a, it's a relative of our North American tyrannosaurs, an earlier relative. And it's got a little bit of plumage around its face here, but its tail is out of control. Look at all this. This is all giant long feathers up to about a foot long, some of them. This thing was a giant, shaggy, nine meter long predatory animal. It defied all these expectations of people thinking, oh, it's just small animals that had feathers. Oh, it's just bird-like animals that had feathers. No, this thing is huge and completely covered in plumage. So then we got some more fuzz on our family tree. Dialong is another relative of the tyrannosaurs. Turned out to be fuzzy as well. Um, and then these animals were identified. These are come from the same beds as that Archaeopteryx in Germany, the sole wolf and limestone. This is Sirenomimus and Juravenator. And Sirenomimus and Juravenator are so run of the mill as little meat eating dinosaurs that scientists can't decide exactly which group they're most closely related to. Part of that's possibly because they might have been juveniles, but in either case, this one, you can kind of see it here. It doesn't show up that well on the slide. It's, he's totally fuzzy. The name Sirenomimus means squirrel mimic because he has this long tail that's just poofy with filaments. And then this one, Juravenator, is really kind of troubling for us paleo artists because it's got scales but it's also got plumes and it looks like the plumes may actually be inserting in between or possibly growing through the scales which is something we see in some modern birds but like th that means that if we find a scaly skin impression that might not mean that the animal is completely naked and also when we put them wherever we put them on the family tree somewhere in this range people argue about exactly which branch to put them on they floof up a bunch of early like ancestors of your favorite big meat eating dinosaurs. We've got fuzzy early tyrannosaur members, we've got fuzzy things that are either megalosaurs or possibly allosauroid things. Some debate about what, where they belong, but no matter where you put them, that means that either these animals lost plumage or were misinterpreting their fossils, or um, some had plumage and some didn't, it's also possible that like, there was a lot of crazy convergence going on due to something that we don't understand. Um, but again, everything we found so far was on the bird line, more or less, until this was found. This is Tianyulong. Tianyulong is a little plant-eating dinosaur. If you look at these teeth, it's got the plant-chopping teeth here. It's also got these cool tusk-like things. That, that It's in a group called the heterodontosaurus because they have crazy teeth. But actually, I'm going to back up to the previous one. If you look here. 
totally shaggy. This is another small animal. So again, people were thinking, oh, well, you know, it's small. It needs to keep warm or something. Um, but again, it floofed up a section of the dinosaur family tree nowhere near birds. And that blew people's minds yet again. Um, and then this was found. This is even further from birds. This is a Cetacosaurus. There's only one specimen with these features on its tail, but we'll enhance again like CSI. Check these out. This thing's got, it almost looks like a horsehair mane or something on its tail. But the rest of its body is in that best case scenario condition where we see the whole skin perfectly preserved. It's even got the horn sheaths over its cheek horns. It's amazing. It's like, it gives us little hints of so much of what these animals look like. On the front of its shoulder here, it's got a very similar scale pattern to what we see in its other ceratopsian relatives. But it throws us this curveball with this little mane on its tail. And then this was found. This is Kulinda dromaeus, which is another heterodontosaur. But it has way crazy features. It has, again, we see filaments, plumes sprouting from between a variety of different scales. Some of them look kind of like crocodilian scales. Some of them don't. And then they've got uh, some of these features are just really weird. Like this, these ones really look like either the scale is giving rise to some type of plumage or it's a new type of plumage. Um, and then there's crazy snake-like scales or like almost like alligator, like Jurassic crocodile back scutes going down its tail. But it's a little plant-eating dinosaur on a totally different part of the family tree. I mean, look at these things. They look like something from an H.R. Geiger creature. Um, and then it's got complex plumage, or what appears to be complex plumage. It's doing weird things that it's not supposed to be doing. And so now our family tree looks like this. Um, oh, and you know what? It should, it should have some plumage up here with the ceratopsians as well. So that begs the question, did all of these animals evolve from a common ancestor that was fluffy? We don't know. But pterosaurs are supposed to share a common ancestor with a dinosaur, and they're very fluffy. So it, it raises more questions than it answers in many ways. And it shows us that historically, because we've been so focused on this idea of dinosaurs as these reptilian, scaly things, we've missed a lot of their adaptability. Um, this is, I think, kind of why. This is all, why have we been getting this wrong? I think uh, the tendency has been to think of dinosaurs as these sort of robotic reptilian creatures operating entirely on instinct. But these were highly social animals. This is, a, this is an oviraptorosaur that's found on its nest. And although this one doesn't preserve feathers because it was buried by probably a sandstorm, it didn't die in that perfect condition to preserve every detail, we know its close relatives have feathers. So if you imagine feathers on this arm, this animal is shielding its young from a sandstorm. Um, now this, again, brings us back to taphonomy. What else is missing? Um, I just thought this would be fun to share with people. Uh, I like to go on long walks on the beach and uh, pick up dead things. Um, this is actually my mom. I was raised right. Um, this is an articulated skeleton of a cormorant. You'll notice that like, scavengers have picked away everything else. Maggots have eaten a lot of stuff. And the only things that stick are, is this tough, scaly skin on the legs. And there's a little bit of like, remnants of the tough skin around the face. This is another one. I see this regularly, and it really causes me, gives me pause as an artist. Like, oh my gosh, like what is missing? And probably none of this will get fossilized because this is on a beach. It's a very weathering environment. Um, but this is important to consider because there's two studies now that have come out that have kind of suggested that maybe, well, feathered dinosaurs might not have had bird-like skin underneath those feathers. There's a, a study that shows that there's this gradual evolution of that thin like that soft, scaleless skin that birds have under their feathers. And then this is a, one of those UV fluorescent, this image is one of the um, bird-like feathered dinosaurs. And it has these very regular bumps under its skin that look a bit different than what we see in birds. Um, so that, again, it makes me wonder what's going, what could be going on with larger animals. Um, these are raccoons and badgers and things that wash up on shorelines. And when you have these these dead bodies in the fossil record going through various processes, it makes me wonder, again, what are we missing? These are Ice Age mammals. These are, these are a minute old. These are as fresh as fossils come. You know, these died, you know, 10 to 30,000 years ago and were frozen in the permafrost. And we know these airily naked vulture monsters <laughs> that were just chasing hadrosaurs around and biting their tails off. Um, I don't know, but I take a lot of really close-up pictures of birds and have all kinds of unnerving thoughts.
Um, this is a very, very handsome Andean condor. He may not be handsome to us, but this is one of the things that we have to think about in paleo art, is maybe beauty in dinosaur world isn't mammal beauty. It's in the eye of the dinosaur beholder. This is the, the, the she's looking at him, carrying him. I mean, look at this, from one to the other. You know, <laughs> these, these, are, these actually were a made pair at the zoo. And it's like, it makes me wonder about things like the dinosaurs we can't see what was going on. And that's kind of some of the thoughts that went into this sculpture. This is a, a tyrannosaur very closely related to the uh, tyrannosaurs here at this museum. It was found, this one was found in New Mexico, and I was commissioned to do this sculpture for a museum in California called the Western Science Center. And I had a lot of lengthy discussions with the museum staff there. I'm like, no, we gotta, we gotta go weirder with it. We gotta make it more bird-like, but still naked somehow. Um, so we played with a lot of fun ideas with that. And this idea that beauty might be in the eye of the dinosaur beholder is actually, it's not just a crazy thing an artist is saying in front of you. There's a growing body of evidence that actually suggests that these animals are assessing their mates based on complex criteria. One line of evidence actually comes from the fossil record. Scientists have looked at the little reflective structures on birds' feathers, and they've identified them in the fossil record, and have been able to show that some raptor dinosaurs had iridescent plumage, and they can even identify sometimes what range of color different microstructures. So on each of these feathers, there's like these little prisms and mirrors that reflect different colors of light. That evolved during the age of the dinosaurs. This is on the back of a really beautiful pheasant called a Lady Amherst pheasant. This is another type of pheasant. This is a peacock. And you can see here that it's like beautiful to look at, even to a human, right? Well, this female peacock, oh, actually, that's another male. <laughs> there are, there's another female milling around here when I took this picture. They actually are assessing their mates based on how vibrant the green is in his plumage. Scientists have done studies where they've shown that the gene that allows peacocks to make green plumage is linked to having a healthy immune system and a healthy musculoskeletal system. Female peacocks preferentially pick males with vibrant green, and studies have shown that they have healthier babies as a result. So, Exactly how the chicken and the egg situation works, like does the female like the green and then that like favors uh, selecting for healthier immune systems or is it the other way around? It's hard to know, but the spooky thing is that these animals are like making choices. Their conscious choices about what they feel affect their evolutionary trajectory. But it's not a dead end, and this is something that I think is really important for us humans who have such a hard time grasping what dinosaurs find is beautiful and how species interactions work. These are hybrid networks of different birds. Many of them, including the Phasianidae, are incredibly prone to hybridization. It happens in the wild with some regularity. All of these birds along the bottom here can hybridize. Actually, well, these two can hybridize with these two, and then I think one of them can hybridize. It's this complex thing. These elaborate displays that are for species recognition and impressing mates, and also displaying genetic fitness, they're not, they, they don't isolate necessarily. And these, the birds in this galliform group, uh, sorry, the, this galliform group here, and the anseriform group, and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, charadriaform birds, the waders, many of the, the ancestors of those groups were already, had evolved in the Cretaceous period, about 100 million years ago. So these animals, in some ways, are giving us a window into the bizarre world of what dinosaurs are attracted to. And it you know, kind of makes me have pause. Maybe the reason we've been getting things wrong about dinosaurs is because we've been underestimating their complexity. We've been underestimating their adaptability. And how long that adaptability has been going on is a key to their success. Biodiversity, whether it's within a population of animals, or within a population, uh, or an entire ecology, or in a culture, I think. I think diversity is incredibly important to survival, and that's one of the big stories that the history of dinosaurs and their insane skin adaptations tell us. This is um, a painting from about 900 years ago. It's showing this bird. But this bird is a wild occurring hybrid of these two insanely different looking pheasants. I think the average human would see these gaudy color displays and think that that's to kind of like separate these animals out, but that's not really how it works. 
these animals' displays drive diversity and drive genetic fitness of their population and allow for all kinds of complexity to evolve, possibly even evolve rapidly. And that's one of the keys to dinosaur success. Um, so thank you all for listening. I hope that wasn't too much rambling about weird spikes and stuff. Um, thank you, Randy and Andrew and Rebecca and Casey and everybody for having me here and you know having chats with me about this stuff. Happy to take part. Evidence when you look at these fossils of any residual pigment to get some idea of what the colors may have been? Yeah, so there's there's a bunch of research going on into dinosaur and other fossil animal pigmentation. The, the really tricky thing, especially with all reptiles, is that um, if you're looking at a scale, for example, um, scales have a three-dimensional depth to them and almost all reptiles can migrate pigments within that scale to shift their hue slightly even crocodilians so that would suggest that dinosaurs assuming the dinosaurs had color vision like reptiles and birds probably some of them could change color and then and additionally some of the pigments just don't preserve a lot of the really vibrant pigments like carotenoids which are what makes carrots orange and shrimp bright pink and flamingos bright pink those are bioactive fatty lipids. So basically as soon as those animals die, and you can, you can see this in a museum collection, when you put a bright pink animal, a bright yellow frog or something in a, a preserving solution, it almost immediately loses a ton of its color because these pigments are, they're like, they're vibrant in part because they're actively used in biological processes and then they degrade, they're fragile molecules that degrade readily. But there is some stuff looking at it's again it's really tricky because these fossils are so old um, and so much gets changed and there's so there's some pretty fierce debates and rivalries in the in the dinosaur pigment color world um, but one of the really interesting things I think that's coming from that is we're learning that these while while we might not be able to figure out exactly what colors every dinosaur was we're learning from trying to do that we're learning that pigments play major roles in all of our physiology for example, the melanin pigment that, that makes skin dark and freckles and dark hair and animals dark, that, that melanin is incredibly bioactive. It does a bunch of other things throughout the body. And fossil research kind of has furthered the understanding of melanin in unexpected ways. So it's a, it, that's a really cool question. And there's, in the years to come, I'm sure all kinds of crazy discoveries will come along because of it. I just want to say thanks to you and all the paleontologists and the volunteers for bringing prehistoric history into our history. Oh man, no problem. <laughs> our pleasure. Hi, um, so we're just like talking about, like I was struck by how many different kinds of feathers and, and just skin permutations or whatever there were that you were talking about and so I guess I'm kind of wondering like when does a feather become like hair like on that spectrum mm -hmm. and do dinosaurs have hair or is it just weird feathers so so the, so the, the thinking has been that feather evolution follows the development of feathers that we can observe in developing chicks so if you open up an egg at different points in the chicks development you'll see the feathers start as a hair-like thing and then branch and then branch again and becomes more complex and th there's this whole process and so it's been thought that dinosaur feather evolution might kind of follow that. Um, some of the latest fossils call that into question. Maybe they were totally novel structures. Um, it's a tricky question because in scientific language, like mammologists really want fur to mean a specific type of follicle and hair inserting into it and oil glands associated with it gets very specific, right? But in terms of external appearance, if we saw them scuttling around in a redwood forest, we go, oh, there's a fuzzy little guy ran by. He's so, he got, I like his fur or whatever. You know, it's like, it functionally, it probably served a lot of the similar functions, but exactly all of what it did and or, or what, why we should call one structure something uh, as opposed to another, is a, it's a, that's a whole discussion that I 
find somewhat tiresome because it just gets into scientific terminology that it sometimes impedes communication. They, a feather is on a bird. That's kind of where most people speaking English learn the term feather, right? So if it's on a bird, do we call it a feather? Well, I don't know. Because if you pluck a chicken, there's all these little hair-like things right under their, their top coat of contour feathers. So <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, honestly. <laughs> Sorry, we got the microphone over here. Yeah, no problem. We'll bring it over to you right after, okay? Sorry about that. I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the connection between paleo art and science. It seems like the observations and, and the things that you're looking at in great detail are kind of scientific. And I was wondering if you ever have been in a situation where some of those inferences actually were really connected with the science, or maybe the paleo art sort of informing some of the science in that sense. Um, yeah, I think that there's a, there's definitely, yeah, it's, it's hard to say because I, I don't have a specific example off the top of my head, but definitely by asking what sounds like a simple dumb question, like, well, what do you look like? What color should you be? Can I make them taller? Like, these, these seem like really simple, like, little kid questions to ask about dinosaurs, but when you get into the nitty gritty of it, then you start asking questions of the scientists, they're like, I never thought of it that way because why would I? I don't care what it looks like. I'm trying to figure out its, phy its phylogeny or how its you know, ankle joints work or whatever. So I've definitely, I think that there is a, an emerging space where paleo artists collaborating with scientists can help enrich the conversation. And, and that's and part of the reason I like doing the art and trying to do the weird stuff that hasn't been done yet is to kind of stir the pot a little bit. You know, I think that the, the history of how wrong we've been about what dinosaurs look like and the vast array of possibilities that are now on the table to me suggest that it's not really scientifically accurate to be confident about paleo art. I think where we're at right now is in this place of like, well, let's, let's, let's talk, let's explore some things and let's be open to new possibilities because clearly Pheasants are open to new possibilities. <laughs> and look at the results. I mean, that is a cool looking bird. <laughs> how long? Okay. How long um, does dinosaur sculptures? How long um, take? And what do you use to make them? Ah, oh, good question. Okay, so it depends on the size of the sculpture and how detailed you want to go with it. Um, but that, like that, the Dilophosaurus that I showed at the beginning, it all, it also depends on how many people you can get to help you. I started that project and then the pandemic started. So for the first six months, I worked totally alone, and then I had a handful of people helping me for another like almost year to make a 18 foot long Dilophosaurus, and we so we built it out of all kinds of different normal building material like you build a house or furniture out of and we coated the outside with rubber skin that we made right we sculpted it in clay first and then we made a mold just like you'd make like if you look up on youtube how to make a halloween mask you can make rubber dinosaur skin the same way or you can make it out of other materials using similar techniques so it's a whole bunch of materials but um i have a youtube channel and i've been posting when i have the time to edit the videos i post my process of, that goes into these things. So you can actually see some of the dinosaurs building on my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash dinosaurs reanimated. Or you can look up my name, Brian Ng Art, on YouTube or Twitter, and you'll see some paleo art process stuff. Okay, so you've talked about Dilophosaurus, mm -hmm. and I think everyone here is familiar with the Jurassic Park version of it with the frill. Yeah. Are there any contemporary animal soft structures that you would like to see or sculpt onto one of your sculptures? Um, yeah, uh, well, yes, I have like a, a whole like folder on my computer that's just like weird like display features that I think would look cool like in certain contexts. Um, but like one of the ones that I've pushed for like a few years now is the fact that um, a lot of meat, well like mo pretty much all meat-eating dinosaurs and all long-necked sauropod dinosaurs have this really elaborate system of air sacs through their whole upper skeletal parts, their vertebrae and even into their ribs and stuff. And in 
these birds and in a whole bunch of other birds, those air sacs have been, they also go up under the skin. So we can see where they interact with the skeleton, and that's cool. Um, but they go way beyond the skeleton in pretty much all the modern animals that have them. And so one of the ideas that I've played a lot with and will probably continue to play with is the idea that, you know, like modern birds, probably a lot of dinosaurs were incorporating air sacs into their display features. Um, I don't know if we'll ever be able to prove that, but I did see a picture of an allosaur specimen from Wyoming where there's a clay infill next to its rib, and it looks like a clay infill of a little bit of air sac that's up against the rib. It has a weird texture to it. I don't know if it actually is that. Nobody's published it or studied it. I'm like, like we need to CT scan this. <laughs> What's up, Brian, Uncle Kate? That was a great talk. I really like the color palette tree with all the feathers on it. Oh, funny. good. <laughs> um, I got a what if question. It's not okay. weird, but I feel like you're in the middle. I, I think you got good opinions. Uh, I wish, I is. would like you to go back in time mm. and be there when I think it was Owen or Huxley who coined dinosaurs mm. and renamed them dino birds, like <laughs> terrible birds. Because from what I can tell, we had some weird thinking going on in London when Waterhouse Hawkins built the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, and which were incredibly conservative compared to what we see as dinosaur biology today. Like, nothing like what you just showed us. Yeah. So, um, from your perspective as an artist, how do you think scientists should really go forward trying to incorporate new, even occasionally brazen ideas about what dinosaurs might look like or other fossil species? How can we find a really nice, happy place uh, where those of us who are really conservative and boring can <laughs> listen to people like you who have these they're actually really great and often supported ideas um, from us? Um, I mean, yeah, you know, I can give you my email, and we can talk about commission rates. No, um, but uh, no, so yeah, I, I think that there's a really important point there that I think if the Crystal Palace dinosaurs hadn't been built, but instead Huxley had built like some elaborate statues of ostrich looking megalosaurs or something, I think it would have shifted our biases in another direction. And I might be the shifting in the other direction. I'm, I have my own biases, obviously. Um, I mean, I love reptiles too, don't get me wrong. Like, you want to talk crocodile and archosaurs, I've got some. Let's go. But uh, it, all that is to say, I, I would say that paleo art, unfortunately, when it's presented without, um, with, without the unknowns like acknowledged and without the process acknowledged, it can kind of lead to regressiveness. It, it, it can actually drag us backwards because, I mean, Huxley was right on some levels. And, um, like Dilophosaurus is a good example of this because it was, it wasn't really thoroughly described when it was found in the 1940s. I think it, it was like the, there was a preliminary description and then another preliminary description when they found the better skull in the in the late 60s, and then nobody really messed with it because it's kind of a beat up specimen, um, and then it got like put in books and then the books mutated into movies and then the movies mutated into you know special effects pop culture movies with frills. Um, or actually, I guess the, the, that was just in the first phase of it being in the movie, and in part because we had never, we had never seen alternative reconstructions of it that were actually made with rigorous skeletal measurements and an understanding of like what the anatomy we're actually looking at is. Because like in the case of the Lophosaurus, its crest is connected to its sinus system. So if we reconstruct it like we would reconstruct any other meat-eating dinosaurs, and actually have an air-filled cask-type thing growing out of the sides of its face. Um, which that's a pretty different view of it. And we, if we had had good paleo art depicting that in the first place, we might have already moved on to describing some of the other air pocket sinus structures that are seen in other weird dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. But, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Do like talk and be honest and, you know, acknowledge how much we don't know. That's, <laughs> I think, at the start. Well, I think that's a great place to end the formal proceedings. Uh, thank you so much. Let's thank Ryan and all the speakers. For